Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Scott, and I work with Americans for Prosperity here in New Hampshire. And we're part of a coalition of organizations that are working to expand uh, educational opportunities in New Hampshire. And as a coalition, we wanted to put together this video to give parents kind of an overview of some of the education options that are available this coming fall. Uh, we recognize that every student is unique and the education option that works for one student might not be the right fit for another. So we wanted to provide the resources to help you make the decision on the best educational environment for your family this fall. And I'm joined today by the rest of the coalition, which includes Representative Glenn Cordelli, Victoria Sullivan, Kate Baker, and Michelle Lavelle. Representative Cordelli is currently serving his fourth term in the New Hampshire House on the Education Committee and is a House representative to the Homeschool Advisory Council. Uh, Victoria Sullivan has served on the House Education Committee for four years, where she was an advocate for play-based learning, um, school choice, and family voice. She currently works on the preschool development grant through UNH. And Victoria has also volunteered in her community by running a child's drama club, coaching several sports teams, as well as serving on the executive board of the New Hampshire PTA. Kate Baker is the executive director of the Children's Scholarship Fund in New Hampshire, which provides scholarships to low-income students. And she's also been an ad education advocate uh, and resource for many years. And then lastly, uh, Michelle Lavelle is the director and co-founder of Granite State Home Educators, which is a 501c4 and uh, with over 2,400 members. She's authored over 500 articles and testified regularly before the New Hampshire legislature and also serves on multiple boards and has volunteered for several years for New Hampshire's largest tax credit scholarship program in support of low-income students. Uh, also volunteered with a startup charter school as well as a private school. So it's obviously been a rough few months for a lot of us, but particularly for our students and educators. And although in New Hampshire, we were more prepared than in most states to adapt to remote learning, it was an extremely difficult process nonetheless. And I'd just like to say a huge thank you to all of the educators for being able to make that switch. I know that it definitely wasn't easy. And uh, remote learning presents many difficulties for educators, and I know many of you had to assist your own children at home during this time as well. So in addition to some of the challenges that educators face, lots of parents and students also struggled. And while some students really thrived with online learning, for others it just wasn't the right fit. But despite the difficulties that we have faced with remote learning, New Hampshire has really led the way uh, for other states. Our districts adapted to this very quickly and worked to ensure that learning didn't stop due to COVID-19. And we've received national recognition for this. Um, so I'm really impressed not only by the educators and the parents, but really by the, the students. Um, this has been such a tumultuous time in their lives and I'm really proud to see how they've handled all of this. So now that we've made it to the end of this school year, many parents have started asking questions about this coming fall. And uh, while some students really struggled with online learning, others uh, thrived, some parents were unable to keep up with their own workloads due to taking on these additional responsibilities that came along with remote learning. And so parents are asking questions about what learning is going to look like this fall. Um, will their child be able to return to the classroom? How can we ensure that students are staying safe, particularly those who are immunocompromised? Um, can your child continue with online learning if it was working for them? So these are all really important questions. And while we as a coalition don't have the answers to every question, we wanted to put together this video to share some of the options that are available to your family that you might be unaware of or unsure of how to get started with. So to start off with, um, let's talk about where we're at right now and the conversation that's currently going on at the state and local level about education this fall. I would just like to uh, echo uh, your comments, Sarah, and the uh, great job done by everybody in New Hampshire and the recognition that we got uh, nationwide. Um, and in particular, thanks to uh, our commissioner, Frank Edelblut and the Department of Education for the great work that 
that they did. Um, but I think it's also interesting to note that uh, parents got a firsthand look at their children's education during this period. Um, they, many parents got uh, greater appreciation for what their teachers do on a daily basis. Um, but they also maybe saw that their children have different learning styles. Uh, maybe remote learning worked for them, maybe it didn't. Um, maybe they didn't like uh, all the things that they saw in the uh, uh, instruction um, coursework that uh, the children had to do. So uh, I think that um, parents are a little bit anxious about uh, the fall. Um, and Victoria, as uh, a mom with uh, two uh, teen boys, um, I'm sure you experienced some of that also. So strange to hear the words teen in front of my boys. They grow up. Right <laughs> um, yeah, and as uh, Glenn, you know, you helped me get the play-based kindergarten bill passed into law, and I actually got a lot of feedback from parents of our the littles, and they really struggled because everything about play-based happens away from a screen, right? So we they really struggled. Teachers didn't know what to do with kindergarten because this is the instruction they would have had. How do they parlay that into the home. And I, you know, we tried to give resources. The DOE did a great job. They have Room, which is um, a website that gives parents the tools to help their children with play-based education. And there were other kinds of outreach like that. But I think for the, the fall, if we go back into a situation where we have to do some remote, because as you, as you discussed, some parents aren't going to feel comfortable sending their children in. Some teachers are going to want to teach from home and we're trying to work on a hybrid. The DOE um, did a survey and it had 85,000 partial responses and I think it was about 45,000 complete responses and there was really a disparity between the safety as far as parents felt like it was a safe environment. It's like 75% of parents felt like it was safe to send their kids back and it was about 85% of teachers didn't feel like it was safe. So you know how do you like what do you what do you do with that information if teachers are afraid to go back and you know if you look at the the data that's coming forward a lot of the teachers are in a higher risk category when it comes to COVID and kids really aren't you know have been pretty much spared from it and we hope that continues so and that, that 25 percent of families that don't feel comfortable sending their kids back in we have to honor that too because they're legitimate concerns so I really think we're going to see a hybrid and we really need to figure out how we move away from so much screen time and have more off-screen activities. But I think parents learned a lot about educating their own children during this time too. Yeah, and even with that survey, uh, there was a question about if kids are back in the classroom, will they maintain any restrictions the local district places on them, like the social distancing? And it was interesting um, that 53% of parents said that the kids wouldn't but 76 of the teachers said they wouldn't. Um, so that was interesting to me. Um, so I, I think you're right about a hybrid model. Yeah, and the commissioner did um, a piece on that saying, you know, we're going to put these guidelines in place and they do, they have draft guidelines for going forward, but they haven't been finalized. There's a lot of local control in what they've put forward. So it's going to like, these are the guidelines, but you as a district have to get your parents and your students and your teachers together and figure out what's best for you because that's the New Hampshire way, right? Local control. Um, but, but yeah, trying to figure out the safety of bringing the kids back because they, we know kids gravitate toward each other. I call them Shakara, the Shakara stones from um, Indiana Jones. When kids get together, there's just all this energy that comes up out of it and it's great. It's why we love kids, it's why we love working with children, right? But trying to tell them to stay separate is going to be really difficult and it might come down to, you know, these families play together so these kids can have that, that closeness when they're at school because it's comfortable, it's natural and those families are okay. I don't know how they how they do it. I think we just accept the fact that some kids are going to be okay social distancing and we have to be okay with some kids who just won't. Especially with some of those younger grades, to tell a six or a seven-year-old you can't go near your friends, it, it's definitely really a challenge and it's something that uh, I think a lot of people are going to struggle with trying to figure out like how much can you discipline those kids that aren't social distancing then. I mean what kind of a burden can we really place on them and 
what are the, the trade-offs there too? And what is the psychological effect of telling kids they shouldn't be married? I mean, you look at little, little ones, like preschool, kindergarten age, they hug, they touch. I mean, they get very close to each other. They pull each other around. I mean, that's just normal play behavior for them. And do we want to bring them up in a way that says, you can't touch your peers, you can't be around other people, you can't have, because we're social people and we need that kind of bonding with other people. And psychologically, we don't want to do that to them either. One thing I wanted to mention, you touched on, uh, Victoria, in terms of the survey. Um, we're going to be talking about options for parents and, and students returning in fall, but there are also options for teachers. Um, there are teachers uh, around the country who are opening um, micro schools, small private schools. Um, I visited one in uh, Laconia last fall. Um, Acton Academy that opened with a handful of students um, and we'll be I'm sure we'll be talking about a few more but um, I think that's a message we have to get out there also that there are options for teachers two teachers can start a charter school um, so teachers you know you have uh, options as well as the students yeah absolutely and uh, now that we've kind of talked a little bit about where we're at now, um, I thought we'd kind of transition to get into some of the options that are available this fall. So uh, Glenn and Victoria, do you want to take that first? Maybe talk a little bit about charter schools. Sure. Um, Victoria, you, your two sons went to charter schools for a while. Do you want to kick that off? Well, I just want to clarify one thing that's often um, misunderstood in New Hampshire, charter schools are in fact public schools. That's right. And we hear a lot of talk about um, anti-charter school conversation and because people don't really understand that they're free to all kids to attend. Sometimes there's a wait list. Sometimes you have to, you know, go into the lottery, especially if they're really good charter schools because they're, they're in demand, but they are public schools that are free and available to all students. Uh, and yeah, and there's all kinds. There's there's charter elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, and a lot of the time they, you know, they, con they have one concentration in that school. And uh, here in Manchester, we've got, I think, do we have four? Kate Baker? Four. Um, and, you know, they go from being very um, oriented on technology to classical education to a more liberal arts kind of, um, education and it suits I've been to all of them and they that the difference in the school structure is really interesting and the families that gravitate to those schools are it's interesting too it's like they've they found their their niche in education and they're much happier and that's uh, one of the things about charter schools as you said they are public schools the state pays the tuition there's no parental uh, tuition involved with a charter school um, but they are freed from the uh, rules put out by the State Board of Education. So they are free to innovate, as you were indicating, of uh, the charter schools in Manchester. And I think that's a, um, a great um, advantage to the uh, charter schools. Um, and there was also one online charter school, the Virtual Learning Academy, um, that has been uh, growing rapidly. And I've attended the last two graduations, and it's um, it's really something to hear the stories uh, from those uh, students who maybe didn't fit in uh, the normal classroom but took to online learning. Yeah, and that's usually what it is. People, you know, kids are looking for a different education for some, for one reason or another, or their parents are. Either the child has had a bad experience being bullied or the class size is just too large and they need something different or they just, they want a different structure. Um, and the charter schools can, can provide that. So yeah, it's really interesting to see how varied they are and the, the personalities. They taught, each school has their own personality and it's really yeah. amazing. Right. And I, I've heard comments about, uh, uh, oh, charter schools aren't as good as you know, my local public school. But based on Department of Education data, in terms of subject and grade level, in seven out of the those eight categories, charter schools outperform the traditional public schools. So, uh, you know, if 
achievement and uh, academics are your concern. Um, don't have to worry about that with uh, our charter schools. And I think part of that too, Glenn, is that those kids want to be there. You know, if you're forced into an environment where you're not happy or it's stressful, you're not going to do your best work. You're not going to be happy in your education. And if they can be in an environment that supports them and they feel like it's, it's a value to them, they're just going to try harder and do better. Right. And that's why, you know, we talk in the legislature about accountability all the time um, and public school accountability. Well, that's nice. We can, we can debate that. But with charter schools and private schools and um, there's greater accountability in that if the parents, I, I see uh, Kate with her fingers doing the walking and um, that's exactly right. Parents can walk if uh, they don't think that their children are being educated properly. And that's the, the greatest accountability uh, in my mind. And you and I fought side by side with Kate Baker and Michelle Lavelle up there in the State House for school <laughs> choice. Um, they're great advocates for families. And, you know, we would hear all the, the negativity and why we shouldn't support this as a state. And there is this fear that there'll be this mass exodus from public schools. It's not an easy decision to pull your child out of a school system where they know all of the kids, they know the teachers, parents feel comfortable with, with the people there. So it's a big decision to seek out a different education for your child. And it's, you know, was it 3% of people in real, in, in true school choice states, it's about 3% of parents that actually pursue that for their kids. So we're not talking about a mass exodus. We're looking, most people really like their, their public school in their town, in their, in their local location. Mm -hmm. But you're looking, you're, we're talking about parents that really need another choice for their child because they're right. not thriving where they are. Right. Um, and I want to give kudos to the department again and the commissioner and that they secured a $46 million grant from the federal government to expand innovation in charter schools in New Hampshire, um, which was almost double the next highest state award. Uh, but unfortunately, that has been blocked by the majority um, and a party line vote in the fiscal committee. And I would urge uh, any parent, any voter out there watching this to, when they talk to the candidates, ask them, how do you stand on that federal grant? Should we accept that money, that $46 million to aid students or not? So um, I, I think that's an, uh, uh, the election is right around the corner and we have to ask candidates uh, their uh, positions. And that goes back to charter schools or public schools. So we basically want public school students $46 million to further their education. Um, and that's, that's the conversation that we need to be happening. That's right, right. Do you wanna head on to talk a little bit about uh, private schools. Um, well, you have a little bit of experiences as well, Victoria. My kids have run the gamut. <laughs> <laughs> they start off in public school, then we went to charter school, and then uh, thanks to the Children's Scholarship Fund and Kate Baker's um, expertise and advice in that field, we actually found my kids attend two different uh, private schools now and they'll probably graduate from two separate private schools because they're just different children that thrive in different environments and we couldn't do it without the children's scholarship fund something I didn't know because I always thought it was not attainable for my family um, because I chose to be a stay-at-home mom for many years so we didn't you know you make sacrifices and one thing I didn't understand was that the schools will also give you scholarships so that's how we get the Children's Scholarship Fund, but the schools also provide scholarship. And then we, you know, we have to make up the rest and which we should, it's our responsibility too. So that's, that was a great gift to my children. And we tell them all the time, people have invested in your future. It's your job to make sure that you do the work to pay back that investment. And then they're more um, invested in their work, in their schoolwork. It's no longer just schoolwork. You know, and we try to tell them that, these schools give you a leg up too. So every hour that you're working, consider it pay because that pay will pay out when you apply for colleges and you get scholarships there. So, you know, I think there are important lessons and values to them when they actually see the value of their education opposed to it's the law you have to go to school. I think there's a different mindset 
And I know that they see their education differently and they have to achieve certain grades to be able to stay in these schools too. They don't, you don't get to, you know, be a troublemaker and you don't get to not do your work and stay because there's other people that want your spot. So I think there are in that too. So I'm sorry. Um, I think there were something over 300 um, private schools in the state and that number is growing. And I think um, as additional opportunities open up, um, the education marketplace will respond with even greater uh, number of schools. And as I mentioned before, the hybrid schools like the Acton Academies. Um, uh, I uh, had uh, read some information a month or so ago about um, a group in Arizona called uh, the Prenda Schools. And they're little micro schools. There's over 80 of them in Arizona. And they're in people's houses, eight to 10 students in each of these schools. How, how great is that? Um, and um, uh, Kate might want to talk about that also. But um, I understand that they are having a webinar at the end of the month um, about opportunities in for Prenda schools. Um, and it's just prendaschool.com. And there again, that's a great opportunity for a teacher who wants to try something different, has a different viewpoint, uh, maybe an entrepreneurial uh, spirit. Um, you know, so there are opportunities for students as well as uh, teachers. And Catholic schools, we wanted to touch on. Yeah, so um, we, we just had a big ruling on that, Glenn, and you and I yes. Side by side for what was SB 193, the school choice bill? What was that a year and a half we yes. fought for that bill? Um, we failed to get it passed here in New Hampshire, sadly. But um, we heard a lot about the Blaine Amendment when we were <laughs> when we were fighting for that. So um, well, based on the Espinoza versus Montana ruling last week, um, which basically said that uh, if the state is uh, helping private schools, they can't discriminate against uh, religious private schools. Um, so we're going to be hearing a lot more about that um, uh, in New Hampshire and around the country. And um, I think that's uh, to the benefit of education for, for everyone. Um, but there was news about Catholic schools uh, just today in terms of opening up uh, for the fall in that they're going to be opening up within classroom instruction, mm -hmm. um, but also discounts, tuition discounts for people who um, have been in uh, other schools, in public schools, who enroll in the Catholic school, they'll get a tuition discount. That's pretty nice. I've seen tuition discounts for people that are enrolled in the school. So like my son, <laughs> family academy, and if we if we get somebody um, to come and apply and attend Holy, Fam uh, Holy Family, not only does that family get a discount, but we really? get a discount. So, wow. Yeah, because I, I think the feelers are really out there for a lot of people right now. Be like you said, they have they have witnessed what their children are experiencing in school. Some of them, I'm sure, are very happy with what they saw. Some of them had a bit of an awakening, and they're seeking out um, other education. But yeah, so the Catholic schools, the Archdiocese also put out a notice that they're having some mini summer courses over the summer and bringing the children back into the classroom over the summer period, which I think is great because it gives them little smaller sized classrooms to test to see if they're spreading it, if this is, you know, how they can handle a bigger situation in the fall, how they're going to manage it because they're cleaning, you know, considerations that they have to make. And this is a good test run for the fall. It was a, it was a smart idea for them to do. Right. Um, did you want to, Sarah, lead us on to the next uh, segment? Sure. So uh, now that we've talked about um, public charter schools as well as private schools, I thought we could hand it off to Kate Baker to talk about the education tax credit scholarships. Yeah, we're seeing what you guys are seeing everywhere. We're seeing at Children's Scholarship Fund so much movement in this space right now. I mean, it's been just amazing. Um, you know, parents at a whole new level are really working to meet their children's individual needs in so many interesting ways. So this has really been kind of a whole new world 
um, in education. There's so many children right now whose education trajectories have been disrupted by this, whether it's an educational disruption or it's a disruption to the family economically. It seems like families really need our help at Children's Scholarship Fund to keep their child on a positive education trajectory, whether that might be a child with medical needs, um, switching from a school that has a building to switching to a homeschool model, or a child who was in a large school setting that the family now feels more comfortable with the child in a small school setting, or vice versa, where a child was at home and, and they've been doing remote learning, but they really desperately want to go, go into a building setting. It's been really um, interesting to see families really working so hard to meet their individual child's needs. Um, and we're so lucky at Children's Scholarship Fund to have these scholarships available that really help families to be able to customize. I mean, you can use our scholarship at any Department of Education approved school, which includes that Acton Academy in Laconia and all the Catholic schools that are now, you, as you talked, Glenn, offering a discount to those uh, micro schools that Michelle's group, the Granite State Home Educators, is partnering with Prenda to do that uh, webinar. And so, you know, our scholarships can do any of that. And we're so blessed to be in that circumstance where we can offer families the opportunity really to customize. And I'm seeing more movement than ever in that space. It's just, it's been amazing. Yeah, and as I said, my children will probably graduate from two different schools and they couldn't have done it without the Children's Scholarship Fund, but one of them is very sports oriented and he had to have a school with sports, where the other one couldn't care less about <laughs> and his sports, but he wanted something where he was more focused on, on certain subjects. And they've worked out amazing for, the, for each of them. And as I said, certain families are attracted to certain schools, that, so they found kindred spirits in each school because that's what they're attracted to. So they found people they're also attracted to that, right? Um, and as a parent, I, can, I live in Manchester, so our school system is very large. And they went from having class grade sizes from three to 400 kids a grade to my youngest has 19 kids in his grade and my oldest has 100 in his grade. So that makes the learning much different. It's much more one-on-one. -on -one. And um, with the remote learning, like, like many parents, I had several teachers I was dealing with, nine teachers, two different schools, two different schedules. Um, but the communication was amazing but it had been all along so i already had those relationships with the teachers it wasn't a, a big deal to continue that when the kids were were learning at home and i think these smaller schools really you know provide that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the teachers but well, there's also people there's also people victoria who now want to continue with um what was remote learning and they might be looking at the VLAX, or they want to continue with having their child at home and so they're, they're homeschooling. It, the interesting thing is you, it's, there's no broad brush for this. I mean, it really, you know, I mean, it, it was a crisis um, it, and it created an economic crisis for sure. And that really had an impact on people and, and honestly, not really in a positive way. And as, as much as, you know, there's some positive things that can come out of it from so many families that are contacting us really are in in spots that are not good for them and they need a solution to be able to get their kids back on track yeah, and, so, and when we talk about hybrids in, in public school systems they've had a hybrid for a while so they my kids used khan academy in their school building in public school and some of the schools use VLAX to substitute certain courses and i know that that happens in the public charter schools too so the kids already had sort of a hybrid even though that hybrid was still in the building so i think that the the change may have been easier for them especially older kids than it was for the parents or maybe even for the teachers um, because you know our kids are so much more tech savvy than we are I, they have to teach me everything um, but so i think bringing that hybrid forward won't be as difficult as it as it may have been had schools not already embraced some of these tools already yeah, and, and the families that we're helping are, are low and moderate income, and many of those families, frankly, are the ones who were um, economically impacted by this. And so, for example, at, as you mentioned, that you have a piece of tuition that you pay for at your child's school. If, if you weren't working and it took four weeks for your unemployment to come through, 
I mean, you need help, you know, covering that piece of tuition to be able to keep your child at the school. And so it's been, um, I mean, how about this? There are options for people and there are solutions, but let's not discount how difficult it's been for people really to get through this whole thing. I mean, we're so lucky to be in New Hampshire where it's like edutopia, right? Where there's all these wonderful things we get to discuss all the time. And it's, it's so important that we just make it a possibility for families to do whatever, whatever it is they need for their child, whether they need a scholarship from Children's Scholarship Fund to go to a private school or to homeschool, where they have VLACs available to them, where they end up in a remote learning. You know, I think this is just an important time for all of us to step up to the plate and really focus on the needs of these individual children and their families and just make sure that we help everyone to get, get back on track. Yeah, and I, I think, as I mentioned before, the big piece for me, I really thought it was unattainable for us especially two kids at private schools, right? Um, but when you told me, you know, that the schools will, will also provide a scholarship, they will help you. And we went and we met with them. And I will admit that it wasn't an easy conversation. No one likes to say, hey, I want my kids to come here, but we can't afford it. You know, it wasn't an easy conversation, but it was well worth it for the education experience that they're both getting. So. Yeah, I have, a, I have a rule that I share with parents. Nothing is impossible until it's actually impossible, right? Whatever you're envisioning for your child is a possibility. Let's try and make it work instead of thinking of the ways that it can't work automatically, right? If we haven't even tried, right? Anything is a possibility. It's, no doors are shut until they're actually shut, right? Let's, let's give it a shot and see, see what we can do together. And you rely on donations from businesses and private citizens um, for your organization. How have you been affected by COVID? So are people more, giving more because they see the need or are they? I mean, both. It, it's, yeah. it's, 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 uh, it looks like every other thing, Victoria. So the way the scholarship fund works is a business can take a tax credit against business enterprise or business profits tax and donate to us for the donation. And an individual can take a tax credit against their interest in dividends tax. And for some businesses, you know, this scenario has made their business go up. So they're gonna have more tax and some people it's made it go down. So they're gonna have less tax. Some people have had cash available to donate because they're in the business of deliveries and some people have had no, nothing to donate. And so, so this, the, the difficulty I think for everyone running an organization like I am, just like the parents is, is a lot of this unknown also, right? And so we're all in that situation together where, you know, I mean, yes, I'm going to keep raising money for these scholarships for kids because I'm hearing new from new families every day who need solutions to be able to keep their child on the path to reaching their potential. And so I'll never stop doing that. But yes, the economy is is in a wild state. And of course, that affects everyone, families and, and us included. So I'll give you the plug of if you're watching and you want to donate to either a school or to the Children's Scholarship Fund, they, they will you'll be helping children across New Hampshire. Um, and the other part of your job, Kate, that isn't always the fun part, is you have to fight against legislators that want to um, defund your program or the Children's Scholarship Fund program. I say your program because you are the face of it. Um, the Children's Scholarship Fund program, nearly every legislative session. There's something. I mean, it's always something, Victoria. It's New Hampshire. Like, we've got a good wild style here. You can't just sit back and relax, you know? <laughs> So yeah, last legislative session, there was a bill that would have cut our available tax credits in half, but the committee that that bill went to, um, they just voted no on that right away, right in committee, and just put that to sleep and said, no, we're not gonna cut this program. So, I mean, our program is here to stay. I mean, we have right now 500 children in 64 schools, 122 homeschoolers. I mean, we're continuing to raise money every day. I think people are perhaps beginning to appreciate that, you know, the kids that we help really do need different options and have those available options to them does actually draw people to New Hampshire, particularly young families to New Hampshire, who see that we have some education freedom here and move here. And we had a net in migration to New Hampshire in that age group of people with young families. And so this program might perhaps be even drawing people into New Hampshire, knowing that we have some education freedom here. And so I, I feel like that's just always going to be a work in progress where someone might not understand how important it is if you're a bullied child in a school and you need to be in a different safe building. It's really important for this program to exist 
for those kids. And, and I think the legislators do hear that. They do hear me when I, when I talk to them about that. Even if you, your child has, you know, big ambitions and their, their school's not going to get them to the level that they need to, to be at, right? That's another piece of this. Not everybody is, as, as we see in, in traditional I mean, public schools, really sometimes they're more in the middle road and you've got the kids on the top or maybe the kids on the bottom that aren't getting the education that's going to put them where they want to be in life. Well, and it's 2020, like you can learn anywhere, you can do anything. I mean, for me, that's just my mentality is shouldn't a child, regardless of their socioeconomic status, be able to do anything? Of course they should. And so I'm gonna always say that, Victoria, I'm gonna always think that all the doors of all the buildings and all the online programs and all the fusion schools and everything should be open to kids, regardless of whether they have money or don't have money. What money shouldn't be a thing that impacts someone's future potential. And so and as, long as, you keep, as long as you keep doing what you're doing, that will be there for the kids. And I just want to make one correction, something you said that the, the, um, the committee that heard the bill to defund the program, um, simply let it die. No, no, Kate Baker was up there fighting like heck for the kids at this. Well, they motioned to kill it. Was a very long conversation. Um, and she fought brilliantly and valiantly for, for the children as she does every legislative session. I, I hope that legislators start to see the value in this and you can take a little rest and not have to fight so hard, but I, I, I appreciate stay out of there. all you do. Yeah, I, I try to stay out of there, but they did that whole committee unanimously, um, ITL'd it, killed it, so right in the committee, so. And before we wrap up with Kate, um, another follow-up question here. So if there is a family who's listening to this and saying, this sounds awesome, uh, I wanna take advantage of this, how can they do that? What are their next steps? So our website is CSF New Hampshire, the word New Hampshire is written out, .org. And on our website, up in the right corner, is you'll see apply. And when you click on the apply page, it's a big orange button that says do our pre-application. So families can do that right now if they have an idea of something that they want to do for their child and they feel like um, economics are in their way. They should definitely apply. Great. So uh, lastly, I think we'd like to turn it over to Michelle Lavelle to talk more about homeschooling. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, we are seeing an explosion of interest in homeschooling and it's really an exciting time. Um, families have had their kids at home during remote learning, but it really is not at all the same as true homeschooling. And that's important for families to recognize during remote schooling that they've had through the spring, the, the school and their public school teachers or their private school teachers were really the ones telling the families, here's what you need to do, here's when you need to do it, and here's how you need to do it. When you're a homeschool family, you get to decide all of that. You get to decide the who, where, what, and when, and how, and it's very empowering for families because you really do get to customize to each child's individual needs and aspirations. And so it's, it's a wonderful difference, a bit of a learning curve for a lot of families. It can be a little intimidating at first, but that's a lot of what we do at Granite State Home Educators is to help support them, answer questions, guide them through their process and their journey. And you know, we're a really fabulous community here. So it's, it's a lot of fun. So Michelle, you probably heard like I did a lot on social media about if, you know, I, I'm homeschooling my child and it's so difficult and trying to get parents to understand that remote learning, when a teacher is choosing the curriculum that they understand and they know how to teach and giving that to a parent who doesn't know even the, the sources that it came from and having them try to, math was the big one. Of course, I knew it would be because that, you know, that common core math stuff, but that was the big one that I heard about. Um, and trying to get them to understand that if you're homeschooling, you can have your children doing the same subject. You, both kids can be doing science at the same time and take two different lessons from it. And you develop your schedule around your family and you decide what the classwork is going to be and you find the resources that make sense to you. Yep, exactly. Kids are different. Even those of us who have more than one child can see, as you were describing to us, Victoria, your boys are very different people, very different learning styles. And homeschoolers, even with multiple kids, can customize programs unique to each child. 
and make it work for the whole family. So whether it's, you know, working on science together and but different depth levels or math together, there are, you know, it's, you can make it work for the family and families, that's the beauty too. You talk to families and they'll each have a different way. There is no one single right way to homeschool. And if you talk to families, they'll have, a, each family will have a unique approach of what has worked for them and their kids. So, you know, so long as you're putting your kids first and, and working together with them, you're gonna be great. It's, so you'll, you'll be ahead. But Michelle, homeschool kids really lack the socialization that other kids have. <laughs> I mean, this whole thing blew that out the window, didn't it? This whole thing blew that out the window. I mean, that's the <laughs> argument that we always hear. And yet, I know I've been at um, the, the C Science Center here in Manchester, and there are several homeschool families there together having a field trip. Right? Totally. That's our norm. When the public school kids were in class, that was the homeschoolers time to have free run of the museums. So it, to be fair, homeschoolers have also been impacted during these closures. Our usual resources have not been as widely available. I mean, homeschoolers might practically live at their local library and utilize the hundreds of resources there that hasn't been fully available during this time. Uh, Co-ops have been limited and, and they're figuring out what fall will look like for them. So it's been a crimp in the homeschool families norm just as much as the public and private school families. But you're right, we get to choose. If we wanna head over to Strawberry Bank or the Courier or any other place or frankly hit the beach and have a lesson there at the, at the lakeside, it's absolutely doable and at our own schedules, what works for our family. And if, you know, from an academic standpoint, if a kid needs that additional time to absorb some material, that's great, use it. Take that time to, to really master whatever subject your kid is studying, or if they're just zooming ahead and it fits their groove, fly with it, keep going. And so it really, you can tailor each child's program beautifully. Yeah, and I've seen a lot of homeschool families that come together to socialize and do things as groups. And um, there's usually an event every summer at um, Livingston Park, and there's hundreds of, of kids socializing, running around, having a great time. So, yeah. and, and I think these little, as Claire was talking about the micro schools, I'm seeing more homeschoolers find a space where they can come to and use together too. I mean, that's how homeschooling kind of originated, where they were these group science projects around somebody's kitchen table or in the backyard. And that kind of, that was always going around once you connected in and found your tribe of people. Um, but there's been more of a move towards these other educational providers, whether it's co-ops or online or, or museums and community places that offer classes. But And now they're coming back to those little home-based co-op type programs. And uh, Presda is one that we're gonna be partnering with for some informational sessions, maybe as early as late next week. So that'll be exciting. Uh, those will be available. Uh, but there's there's a lot of innovation right now. So, so many things, uh, all over from new online programs starting. Uh, I know, as Glenn was talking about, teachers are looking for more options. And I'm here getting contacted from teachers who want to offer new programs and plug into the homeschool environment. So it's really a very exciting time for homeschoolers all the way around. The opportunities are tremendous. And Michelle, for parents that might want to start homeschooling, what are their requirements? What do they have to do to prove that they're actually teaching their children? Sure. The requirements are really very straightforward. Um, three simple things. Uh, they have to fire, fi file a letter of intent with either their local SAU, a private school that offers that, or the Department of Education. Very simple requirements, very minimal information, kids' name, birth date, home address, parents phone number, and that's about it but file that within five days. You get a notification letter back from your whoever you've sent it to, and you're ready to go. And you don't have to have it all figured out right away. You can work with your child, especially if it's an older student, 
to figure out what is it that you want to do? What are your goals? What are you trying to aim for? And then work your way back as to, okay, what does that mean for doing studies this year? What should we be focusing on? Um, so that's one requirement, the letter of intent. The second one is to have a portfolio of your child's work at different points throughout the year, something that's representative of what they've been working on. But it can be wide ranging, like videos of them performing or being in, um, taking music lessons of some sort or being in a play or, you know, a science experiment that they did, artwork. It doesn't have to be just workbooks and tests and quizzes and book reports. It can be, but it doesn't have to be limited to that. Uh, you need to include a reading list too, but that's, you know, it can be for your pre-reading children, folks who aren't independent yet. It can be what books you've read with your child, because that's just as valuable to their learning and reading skills. And then the final requirement is some sort of year-end assessment. But there again, the parents have a lot of top choices and options as to how to best reflect their child's learning throughout that year. It can be a test, it can be a teacher evaluation, or something completely different that they work out with the school that they sent that original letter of intent to. So there's a ton of flexibility to still meet these basic requirements and the results are kept private. So that's an important distinction too. But it's it's really not that hard, it's not that onerous, and frankly, it can be a wonderful way of looking back and reflecting on all the wonderful things your kid has done throughout the year and how much they've learned and gained from that process. And as we're looking forward to um, the elections, as Sheriff Klen has mentioned, not only is, is the Children's Scholarship Fund always under fire, but the homeschoolers are always under fire. And uh, I think Glenn can attest to the fact that we had a bill that would have really uh, put some regulations, strict regulations on homeschoolers that, that schools didn't have to abide by. They were, they were stronger than what the schools would have to abide by. And the homeschool families came out. We had to move to Reps Hall, which holds 400 and something people, because so many families came out to fight for their rights to educate their own children. And I will tell you that those children sat there for hours and hours and hours, and they were really well behaved. And they were not on electronics to keep them busy either. They, they were very good at self-regulating and and being there. So, you know, don't mess with the homeschool people because they will come out and fight for their rights. It, it's very important that parents um, understand that this is something that um, they have to be proactive in. And it's, it's been a wonderful community. We've had different opportunities over the years for parents to share their voice and their experience and how much they value that kind of educational freedom and autonomy to direct their children's education. And so it's a, it's really, actually I enjoy it. I get to hear all from all these families and hear their stories and how much homeschooling has meant to their families. It's, it, I get all weepy hearing them, it's, it's cool. But yeah, it's it, important work so I can understand the emotional aspects of it. Michelle, if families are listening and they think that they want to explore home education, what resources and tools are out there for them? How do they get a hold of you? Sure. We have a website. It's granitestatehomeeducators.org, all spelled out. Uh, we also have a Facebook page and group. So our page has a lot of public information. Some of our public events are posted there. Uh, so it's easy to see and find. Even if you aren't registered with a Facebook account, you can find all that information. We have a monthly newsletter. So if you're not on Facebook, not a problem. You can get things delivered directly to your email every month. Uh, but for those who are on social media, we have a very, very active Facebook group with over 2,400 people. We're adding, goodness, probably 50 people a week right now. So lots of people who are new to homeschooling who are in the same situation as you may be right now, um, looking at homeschooling as an alternative for your family. We're also hosting two in-person events in the next few weeks, one in Dover on July 21st and one in Northwood on uh, August 10th to talk about homeschooling, what are the simple ways to meet these requirements and how to customize your program, at least get it started and answer questions. Uh, we're also gonna be hosting two virtual things in, in August. So. For folks where the date and time and location may not be a good fit, 
no worries, we'll have some things online for you to plug in and we'll be announcing that soon too. Excellent. And you know, Glenn's up there still fighting the good fight for everybody. And uh, I think it's really important that, that people take this information and they ask candidates going into 2020 how they feel about school choice because often candidates like Glenn or representatives like Glenn are beat up for being anti-family, anti-children, anti-education. And it couldn't be further from the truth, but that is that is the spin on it. These are, you can tell from the conversations, these are people that are passionate about what they do. It's about supporting the family, supporting every child and giving every child opportunity. And you need to ask your candidates if they support that. And something I I'd really, no, go ahead, Michelle. I was just going to say, I think it's a really important issue. It's really hitting people at their homes this year more than ever. Um, with remote learning having mixed results, um, I think there's a lot of fa families who are perhaps more personally aware of the importance of educational freedom. So it's, it, it, I think, a major issue right now. And something I'd just like to highlight, um, for any families out there who are maybe thinking that uh, homeschool seems like a good option for them, but are worried about not knowing some of the subjects or not being um, kind of like able to teach their children all of the different things they need, uh, I'd like to point out that there, you can have a hybrid of things. Um, something that I, I was actually homeschooled for several years as a kid. Um, I tried all the different uh, education options. But when I was homeschooled, um, the majority of my learning took place at home, but I also took classes through my local public school. And I've known other people who have taken classes through the Virtual um, Learning Academy uh, through VLAX. And so um, if you're a parent who thinks, I don't know all these subjects, or I'd like my child to have interactions with other students or other teachers, um, there are opportunities for hybrid versions of homeschooling. Absolutely. We have several dynamic and really exciting different co-ops around the state. Um, you can find them on our website and they're often, um, we share that information in our Facebook page and group too. Because you're exactly right, Sarah. Parents don't have to be the only source of in information for their kids. They certainly can be and have an important voice in their child's education. But you don't have to know everything and be brilliant in everything for your kids to have a dynamic and diverse uh, learning experience. What I learned through remote learning was that my children knew where to find the experts on things on YouTube and <laughs> online already because they sometimes didn't understand the way their teacher was conveying something and they could easily access it. They have no idea. Like when we were most of, well, Sarah, you're young, but for most of us, it, we needed information. We had to get on our bikes, get to the library, go through the little index <laughs> card. <laughs> it was a much bigger deal than clicking on a link and getting everything. So the kids are really good at, at gathering that information for themselves too, to, to, to support their own education. One more question I have for Michelle. Um, I've worked with kids for a number of years and one of the biggest things I've heard from parents as to um, one of the biggest hurdles I guess they have with homeschooling is their ability to work while also educating their child. So is it possible to have parents working while also homeschooling? Absolutely and that does come up a lot. A lot of especially with remote learning is parents are trying to juggle those responsibilities. And it, I, I'll be honest, unless a parent has a home-based business, it's particularly difficult when the children are very young. Because, you know, if you've got to meet your employer's requirements and it's a strict nine to five, that can be particularly challenging. But as, depending on the, the parents' jobs and depending on the age and educational needs of the children, you really can actually have even more flexibility. I know families that have flex hours, work from home, take breaks, work with their kids, then go back to work once they kind of get their kids situated with whatever it is they're gonna do and check back periodically. There are parents who have different shifts. So one parent is home with the kids while the other one does whatever they need to do away from the home. They also can utilize extended family and friends to be watching the kids while still homeschooling because it can still be at the parent's direction even if it's not the parents directly supervising the kids. So there's lots of different models parents can utilize to still homeschool their child while juggling their own work responsibilities. 
Great. And so before we wrap up here, I'll throw it back to you guys. If there's anything that you felt like you missed or you wanted to um, let people know about before we wrap up. I, I just want uh, I to would, great job, yeah. everybody, first, because, you know, it's been really, um, you know, families are really stepping up to the plate right now, you know, with all of this movement and working to meet the needs of the kids. And so are schools. I mean, the schools just did hero work in transitioning to remote learning and then working on how they're going to open in the fall. And so, you know, it has really been challenging for people, you know, from a health standpoint, from an economic standpoint, from a, we had to stay home or we didn't stay home or, I mean, for everybody, it's been a huge disruption. And so, you know, my sentiment is just, you know, great work, everybody just keeping your head above, we'll keep your head above water, right? It's, it's been really good. So I've been really, you know, great work, everybody. Yeah, I think this was great. Thank you for letting me be a part of it. I, the only thing I would add to, to parents is kids were great about changing courses and doing what they needed to do. Some of them might be feeling more taxed than they're letting on. So make sure you have that conversation to see how they're doing and play. Play is so important in education and in families and keeping, you know, your mental health. So just have a conversation with your kids and check on them. Make sure that they're doing as okay as they, they look like they are. I would say that um, there has been a lot of anxiety. Families are experiencing anxiety now, uh, both um, economically and uh, thinking about school. But uh, sometimes when there's anxiety and, and hard times, there also becomes opportunities out there. And I think that's where we are now also. And I think everyone is, thank you all of you for um, uh, your information that you've given people because there are opportunities uh, for uh, families, students, and teachers. Yeah, I'll just kind of echo that um, as a thank you to everybody um, for the, the teachers, the parents, and the kids. Uh, it's definitely not been an easy time for anybody. Um, and also thank you to Glenn and Kate, Michelle, and Victoria. Um, for putting this together today and letting me be a part of it. And then just for all of the work that you guys have done over the years, I know you've all put in um, a huge amount of hours and dedication to all of this. So thank you for that. And um, I just wanted to kind of let people know that one option that we didn't get to talk about here today is traditional public schools. And we talked about charter schools, but didn't really give an overview on uh, traditional public school setting. And that is because we're still unsure, kind of like we mentioned earlier, unsure of what that will look like this fall. Um, but as guidelines and decisions are made by the state and the districts over the next couple of weeks, we'll follow up with a video um, explaining more about uh, those options for the families who think that might be the right fit for them. So thanks so much, everybody, for listening here today. Um, I hope that some of this information will be useful for all of you in making a decision on what the best option for your child will be this fall. Um, every child learns in a different way, and I hope that the overview kind of gives you a better understanding of some of the options that are available for you and gives you an idea of what might work best for your child. Um, at the end of this video, we're going to share a list of resources, but please feel free to reach out to any of us if you have more questions. I'm sure everybody here is more than happy to uh, provide more resources and answer questions. Uh, so I hope you guys all stay safe and have a fantastic summer. Thanks.